is part eight of uh, Understanding Islam, Unpacking the Dhimma Pact. And we're looking at the return of the Dhimma as a, an instrument of Sharia law. In, the 19, in 1850, the Ottomans declared the equality of all their peoples under law. So in effect, they abolished the Dhimma. They were under pressure from the great powers, the Europeans, who were assisting them against the Russians. Uh, and there were other countries, other Muslim countries, that were invaded or colonized by Christian powers, such as Egypt, uh, who therefore stopped the Dhimma, stopped the jizya payments and so on. But there was a backlash, as I mentioned. For example, the Christians of Damascus uh, suffered a pogrom in 1860, and that was a local backlash from the, from the Muslim community because the Dhimma had stopped, and the Christians were lifting their heads up. They were dressing well. They were beginning to ride horses. This offended the local community. And the 19th century was a period of struggle for Dhimmi communities. The Greeks, who'd lived under Islam for many centuries, fought for their freedom going into the 20th century, and there was an exchange of peoples. The Turks left Greece, and the Greeks left Asia, Asia Minor, and the Greeks established a kingdom. The Serbs also became free after centuries of domination. Earlier, the Hungarians had been liberated. Armenians, to some extent, were successful, because there is an Armenian state today, but they were also unsuccessful because the Armenian genocide uh, killed over a million Armenians. And the, the justification from that made by the Turks was that the Armenians wanted independence. They were breaching their pact of surrender. So their, their blood was halal and um, more than a million were killed in the great genocide. And the Assyrians also suffered a similar um, genocide in the 1920s. And they've gone through the second genocide in the 21st century um, under American occupation. The Maronites were unable to really establish an independent Christian country. Uh, the Christian population of Lebanon was um, more than 50% uh, 50 years ago, but now it's declining and less than that. And they are gradually being squeezed out. The Copts never attempted a national liberation campaign. It would have been unthinkable, uh, but they've also suffered greatly in the uh, Islamization of, the, of, uh, of Egypt the re-Islamization. What's been happening in the last hundred years is that the Muslim community, sensing their own failure and they weren't being successful, decided the reason for that was they weren't being Islamic enough. And if only they practiced Islam enough and put on their hijabs and prayed properly, uh, then they would be successful in the world again and dominate the masters of the world again. And so you have this process of uh, Islamic revival, Islamic reformation, going back to original principles, and you'll see a political change happening in many countries. Pakistan was a secular state in 1947. Its founding constitution was secular. And then it was declared a Muslim state. And then in the 70s, uh, the Sharia courts were introduced. In, the, in 84, blasphemy was made a capital offense. And there's been a progressive re-Islamization of Pakistan, which has made um, the climate for non-Muslims increasingly one of alienation, discrimination, persecution. So it's just getting worse and worse every year. And very traumatic to hear the stories of Christians in Pakistan. Not only Christians, Hindus and other minorities suffer a great deal there as well. But that, that Islamic revival that's been taking place in Pakistan has been happening in other countries as well. Egypt has become much, much harder for Christians than it was 50 or 60 years ago. Um, this is part of the glowing, growing uh, re-shariarization of the Islamic world. It's the advance of Sharia law. If people are putting on the beards and covering themselves up, they're also discriminating against Christians and reasserting aspects of the Dhimma system. There are other struggle zones in Sudan, uh, nor the northern part. The government declared Sharia law. The Christians refused and they fought. I said, uh, I might have said a million before, but two million uh, are estimated to have died from South Sudan. Um, Christians and animists in the jihad that the North unleashed against the South. In Indonesia, the Laskar Jihad declared war on Christians about 14 years ago, and um, Christians refused to accept the Sharia implementation. They held their ground, and um, perhaps if they've asked for a dimmer, they might not have been killed, but a half a million Christians were rendered homeless uh, in Indonesia just over a decade ago, and some thousands were forcibly converted, circumcised, and the rest. Nigeria, the conflict in the northern states, is about the implementation of Sharia law. Boko Haram's goal is to implement Sharia. Um, Bill Clinton says it's because they're poor and they need more development. And then if they had more development, they wouldn't be upset. Uh, in fact, it's not to do with that at all. It's a religious war. It's a, it's a jihad, really. And these sorts of struggles are going on in many places around the world. There have been recent uh, reports of imposition of jizya. 
from Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Algeria, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and Pakistan. So these are localized jizya payments. It's not, they're not run by the governments. They're run by local communities, local militias. Um, and here's a report from just this past week in the Washington Times, September the 10th, 2013. The Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters have begun forcing the roughly 15,000 Christian Copts of Dalga village in Egypt to pay a jizya tax as indicated in Quran 929, author and translator Raymond Ibrahim reported on Sunday. According to Father Yunus Shakwi, who spoke to, uh, yesterday to Dosto reporters in Dalga, all Copts in the village, without exception, are being forced to pay the tax. Some are being expected to pay 200 Egyptian pounds per day, others 500 pounds per day. Mr. Shakwi said, according to the translator, said, according to the translator, in, other, in some cases, families not able to pay have been attacked. As many as 40 Christian families have now fled Dalga, Mr. Ibrahim reported. The taxes are not unique to Egypt either. Just over the weekend, Syrian rebels went into a Christian man's shop and gave him three options, become a Muslim, pay 70,000 as a tax levied on non-Muslims, known as jizya or be killed along with his family. So the three choices, the Christian Science Monitor reported. There have been a number of reports of jizya being imposed by the Syrian rebels upon the Christians in Syria. Now, the Islamic world has created its own human rights instrument, the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam. And uh, this was in August 1990 by the 19th Islamic Conference of Foreign Ministers of the Organization for the Islamic Conference. It's now called the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. Article 24 of the Cairo Declaration says this statement is subject to the Islamic Sharia, and Article 25 says the Sharia is the only source of reference for the explanation or clarification of the Declaration. So this document of human rights in Islam puts the Sharia above human rights. That includes the Dhimma. So the official view of the Muslim world is that this system is part of human rights. It should be accepted. And this was published by the United Nations, in fact, by UNESCO. Um, in uh, the 20th century, communist societies were the greatest persecutors of Christians, but today the largest number of persecuting nations are Islamic. And the relation between this and the teachings of Islam is that the persecution of Christians tracks uh, the Dhimma regulations. And I'll explain this in the next and final session of this uh, series.